Doctor, let's just talk about breast cancer for a little bit. I think it's one of the um, you know, top two or three uh, conditions that we hear about all the time and uh, when it comes to health. Uh, can you talk about what maybe be behind the rise in incidence of that and, and what we may be able to do to help yeah, take I, care of that? I, I think breast cancer is a really a horrifying um, circumstance for many women. Um, we've had problems in really looking at early prevention programs. We've had arguments about what the correct uh, age for mammography mm -hmm. should be. We've looked at self-examination. We've had reports on the one hand that all of these in the early intervention uh, attempts have not really given us uh, the benefit we may have anticipated, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, we feel very strongly that they're an important part of public health screening for breast cancer. Um, you're asking me a question about breast cancer and why do I believe it's on the up? Well, I've got to implicate environmental toxicity from what are population studies because there are certain areas you know, that we can see geographically where we can associate environmental toxicity. Um, you, you know, for example, the very high prevalence of breast cancer on Staten Island or Long Island where there's been a tradition of many years of dumping of waste that could be toxic. We've seen uh, circumstances of the increasing use of what are called xenoestrogens, uh, meaning uh, kinds of chemicals that have estrogenic activity that you find in the food chain. We obviously have really sad outcome from the Women's Health Initiative studies where we see that uh, Premarin and Prempro, conventional hormone replacement therapy, was associated with um, a higher incidence and prevalence of breast cancer. And of course, this angered, I think, a lot of women appropriately because um, arguably the Boston Health Initiative, they actually described uh, this long protracted e experience with um, conventional hormone replacement therapy as some kind of uncontrolled experiment on women. I don't necessarily want to get into that. It uh, has its own political ramifications. But now we have a move towards using bioidentical hormone mm -hmm. therapy, but we don't have sufficient data to really state emphatically it's safer or better. So the reason I'm going in this direction is because I have a preference for a simple, gentle, natural approach with lifestyle modification and herbal and nutritional supplements rather than hormones. But I would use and do use bioidentical hormones under the correct circumstances. Now, obviously, if I knew exactly what was going on in the breast cancer epidemic, um, you, you know, I'd be a very privileged person. But we've got genetic tendencies. We're understanding more about hormonal sensitivity of some of these cancers. Uh, obviously, um, there's the issue of estrogen-dependent cancer versus non-estrogen-dependent. And there's work going on now on, you know, how uh, maybe stem cell cancers are what it's all about, where you have this population of cancer stem cells that the real important aspect of the tumor promotion. We're seeing evidence in that area. So we're seeing it from a variety of circumstances and I think what we do have, we, we have certain knowledge that things like exercise is preventive somewhat against breast cancer, as is um, perhaps reduction of saturated fat intake, arguable. Uh, breast and womb or uterine cancer are associated with obesity. There's a clear association developing between insulin resistance, perhaps, and breast cancer. So um, I'm not answering your question because it's such a multifactorial mm -hmm. circumstance. 
But we have some very exciting substances out there that I think could make a difference. I'll give you one example. There's an extract of raspberries uh, or pomegranates. It's called elagic acid, which has a very interesting effect uh, tending to turn malignant breast cancer into a lesser form of malignancy. So it's actually um, a sort of changer of the degree of malignancy. Perhaps not consistently, but there's an example of a natural compound. We know about antioxidants, we know about hormonal manipulation, and we know, for example, I wrote a, a best-selling book called The Soy Revolution, published by Dell, almost a decade ago. And in that book, I pointed out the protective nature of soy food diets on breast cancer, which is also something that um, revered researchers like T. Colin Campbell, the author of The China Project, got out of many years of study of soy food consumption in oriental populations. And the data supports that if soy food is taken early in life, it creates protection in adulthood. And that's probably because the soy is altering or modulating the effect of lifetime exposure to estrogen. So see how complex these matters are. And, you know, I, I'm very supportive of aggressive uh, screening, uh, secondary prevention, which is really all about diagnosis at a time where the intervention makes a difference. And we're still uh, beleaguered by the problem that breast cancer can present often in an advanced stage which has a poorer prognosis than a cancer detected early in general terms. Mm -hmm. So again, a mixture of factors, and um, I'm optimistic. I'm always optimistic uh, about our ability to one day beat, um, you know, breast cancer in general. But we've got a long way to go before we fully understand prevention, and mm -hmm. it's a focus, I think, of uh, anti-aging medicine. But we've got to look more at prevention, and uh, you know, I think. Innovations in surgery have helped. I'm not denying that. But maybe we've got some other alternative pathways. I'm very, very much into advanced preventive medicine.